Many people are claiming the New York Knicks aren't legitimate contenders given Julius Randle is their best player. Whether or not Randle can be the alpha dog in the playoffs remains to be seen, however, Jalen Brunson continues to get disrespected by casuals, skeptics who aren't properly acknowledging how important his 24.7 assist averages on the year have been to this Knicks team. Since the trade with Rip City for Josh Hart, New York is an undefeated 6-0. On the year overall, this team owns one of the best benches in the NBA. What if I told you the New York Knicks, who'd be good enough to rank second in the West if they were in that conference, aren't being gassed up at all? How'd one simple coaching decision back in December help the Knicks out tremendously, and what's the ceiling for the 2023 Knicks? Right quick though, just 13.7% of you watching are subscribed, so please subscribe, and to also help this video spread, please leave a thumbs up. Stephen A. Smith has moved on. He yes. or the Knicks making it to the finals. Right. Stephen A., you would be rooting for Miami? I would be rooting for Miami. A decision to hop off the Knicks bandwagon, which may have been the best call for both he and his supposed Knicks regarding their karma. Bill Simmons could learn something from him by ending his tenure as a Boston Celtics fan given all the hate he's given to Klay Thompson recently, but I digress. Speaking of Celtic fans though, and in response to this tweet about the Knicks potentially being the second best team in the East, a flurry of Boston supporters were disagreeing with that take to say the very least. Thing is, I don't think that take from Ben Detrick, which states the Knicks are better than anyone outside the Bucks in the Eastern Conference, is the most outlandish thing. Obviously, Milwaukee is the clear-cut number one, having won 14 straight as of this recording, but outside of that, and New York, in my opinion, has as good of a chance to come out of the East as anyone. Josh Hart just got Jason Tatum ejected in a game against Boston where there were questionable calls on both sides. Jalen Brunson even received a technical foul after this no-call where Marcus Smart clearly hits him. And let's not lie to ourselves that Randall hit Tatum on the arm right here. Ref BS aside, and New York's W versus the team with the most wins across the NBA acted as a bona fide statement from this Knicks team to the rest of the NBA. That statement initiated itself on the defensive end, where in the first half, New York at one point forced the settling for threes Boston Celtics to miss 16 straight of those triples. Later on, this team's most important paint protector by far in Mitchell Robinson would make this momentum-shifting backside stuff where he'd elusively rotate off Blake Griffin and deny Tatum of any potential Kodak moment. Let's ultimately be fair to Boston though, this team was missing the Black Panther Jalen Brown and a top guard defender across the NBA in Derek White. Meanwhile, New York was fully healthy, but let's not dismiss the type of role this Knicks team has been on over the last several weeks. The national champion from Villanova's miracle 2018 run has taken and ran with this change of scenery away from Dallas, getting more opportunity to run the show as the pick and roll ball handler, and without Luka, the isolation volume has been of course significantly upped from Brunson as well, all to the benefit of Coach Thibodeau and the passionate New York fan base that's waited seemingly a lifetime for this type of winning basketball and shot creation from their top creator. Brunson, among players who've played at least 50 outings, is scoring the fifth most amount of points per game as the pick and roll operator, perfectly complementing the on paper number one scorer Julius Randle, who's ninth just behind Kevin Durant in points via isolations. The mix of Brunson's mastery maneuvering around ball screens and Julius Randle's elite one on one ability is what can be primarily attributed to New York being on an absolute tear as of late and having one of their better campaigns as a franchise in recent memory. But they haven't received too much respect. Here was JJ Reddick's statement on Jalen Brunson specifically not getting the proper respect from the media. Brunson and I gave him some love, and what I said was, since January 1st, since the you know the start of the new year, he's playing as well as any guard in the NBA outside of Damian Lillard. I said that those are that was a direct quote right there. And the responses to that showed me how many fucking casual fans there are. Some people were like, well, what about Steph? I'm like, well, Steph is injured right now. <laughs> He's not playing. <laughs> what the fuck? 
A lot of that lack of recognition Brunson receives comes down to the fact that he's a smaller guard whose archetype hasn't necessarily translated well to playoff basketball in the past. The reason that narrative, though, can't be applied in this case, however, is based off the previous playoff success of Jalen individually. As Dallas's second option last year in the first round of the playoffs against Utah amidst a six-game series W, this is a guy who averaged damn near 28 points per game, which came on 58% true shooting. He was extremely solid all throughout that Mavericks playoff run. Skipping ahead to this current month of February, though, for his new team in New York, and across 10 games, Brunson has posted similar numbers to what he did in that playoff series last year against Utah, 27 points and 6 dimes per night, but on a much better 64% true shooting mark. We can't dismiss potential improvement in this man's game, by the way, given Jalen's just 26 years of age about to enter his prime. Of course, only time will tell if Jalen can match his 2022 playoff production with his new squad in 2023, but based off the fact that he's again the second option with the Knicks behind Julius, just like he was behind Luka in Dallas, that could mean New York could make a similar postseason run as that Maverick squad. Fueled by their newest addition, a vibrant two-way shooting guard who can evidently get under opponent's skin in Josh Hart, a near 20 point per game developed RJ Barrett, who's annually improved on both ends of the court, then an outstanding guy to have as a fourth or fifth go-to weapon in Emmanuel Quickly, whose shifty shot creation can cause a ton of issues as we saw against the Celtics, the Knicks are resembling contenders. And who knows, maybe this is when veteran leader and all-time legend in Derrick Rose finally gets his first ring, if things go according to plan this spring. Beating Milwaukee four times out of seven, though, is seemingly impossible, and for a team that missed the playoffs this year, Knicks fans may want to slow their roll in terms of having expectations of winning a title, but of course, anything's possible. And being completely honest with you, this next segment could very well display that this current version of the Knickerbockers may actually be ready to compete for their first championship since 1973. If you're a heavy skeptic, first of all, New York's proved most of those skeptics wrong already. As ESPN projected they'd win a total of 38 games this year, they already have 36 with 19 outings left. But more noteworthy is how the Knicks are peaking as a collective unit at the perfect time. As I've briefly touched on a few times, Josh Hart has proved to be the missing piece since coming over from Portland, averaging 14 points per night on a monster 60 plus percent shooting from both three point range and the field. Hart's true shooting percentage is at 74.6% since the trade and his 15.5 net rating, albeit in a limited six game sample size, if extended over the course of a season, would rank as number one among all NBA players. Don't forget, Josh is also giving you five boards per game as an above average rebounding guard. Man can do it all. Hart's been a big contributor to this New York squad, practically being undefeated over the last 11 games. They've actually gone nine and two, but they led by 10 against the Sixers midway through quarter number three in one of those games, and with just 1.1 seconds left in the game against the Clippers, they led by three in the second of those L's. That aforementioned 9-2 record was the Knickerbockers' best month of February in a staggering 33 years. A rotation changeup which has led to that is Thibodeau going from an 8 to a 9-man rotation with the increased minutes of Quentin Grimes. Since that big decision back on December 14th, the Knicks as a team own the NBA's second best net rating, a 25-15 win-loss record, which is the fifth best in the NBA, and they're turning the ball over the second least amount of times among all 30 squads as well. When you combine that with what we talked about in my last Knicks video, being all the other leads this team's blown, and it's clear New York is a lot better than their record. Proving the depth this team has, against Boston, Brunson, Randall, and RJ combined for just 50 points, but the Knicks still beat the number one team in the NBA by 15. That was made possible by Josh Hart, Obi Toppin, and Emmanuel Quickly, combining for 44 off the bench, and Mitchell Robinson having a typically solid outing on both ends as well, with 10 points, 2 blocks, 2 steals, and 13 boards on 5 for 5 shooting from the floor. Who's the unsung New York Knicks hero though? Is it Brunson or someone else? 
Leave your take on today's question to compete in Community Speaks. The shout out from my last upload goes to Marmalee, who says, sure, load managing is disappointing if your favorite player is sitting out when you go to a game, but fans will understand the long-term importance of being ready for the playoffs. The game is so fast and physical that a body can't get enough rest, especially with all the back-to-backs. The schedule has to change, either lengthen the season or reduce the number of games, and cut down on back-to-backs requiring travel. Great take right there. Appreciate every answer. Thanks for watching and peace.